strangers back from the island, bricks from the four corners of the world. There are fat ones. They're all inside. about it for about 10 years. Now, that took a lot of thought because that's a really big step. In, that's a really big step in anybody's life. I mean, that's somehow changing the way you look. And um, unless you're a blind person that knows how people look by, by touch alone, mm, people are going to view you differently. And because that's the first thing that we see, I, you know, the eyes are sort of put right in the middle of the face, and our first contact with another human being is the face, and our, our, our structure is, is geared towards the face. So that's a very powerful statement. And um, I, it took me a while to get used to it. When I first tattooed my face, it was very shocking. Like the first time I saw myself in the mirror, it was really weird. Really, really weird. It was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, wow, what have I done? And, and not in a bad way, but it's this really powerful, powerful emotion. And, um, in a way, I liked it. But I also knew that in some way I set myself apart from, from the straight world. Like, I, I knew that at that point I, I had, um, decided I wasn't going to run away and join the office. one of the big security channels that we all have had just been cut out of my life by me. And it's real dangerous because, you know, you can really cut yourself bad if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, it really is broken glass. As you can see, it's not like... See that? Yeah. It's, it's like real broken glass. There's no trick to that. And this is really the most dangerous part, these little things here. Because they can get in your hand or your arm and uh, and once they get in, like they literally never get out. I really delve delve very deeply into that whole hardcore punk rock, you know, 80s lifestyle. Uh, you know, a crazy artist lifestyle, which was a complete rebellion in the middle-class suburbs that I come from, and eventually that lifestyle almost killed me, and, and part of the lifestyle became moving from one place to another, you know, you, it's a lifestyle of burning bridges, so I'd burn a bridge and move to another, and burn another bridge and move to another bridge, and eventually... I got, you know, I had a few tattoos along the way, but not that many. You know, when you live that way, you don't really have the money to get a lot of tattoos. Let's be realistic, you know, tattoos cost a lot of money. Eventually, that lifestyle slowly led me to New York City. When I got to New York City, I decided I was going to tattoo my whole body. Because uh, I felt that if I tattooed my whole body and I had to move again, at least I'd have something to take with me. When I first uh, moved to New York, I uh, I got a job street vending in Midtown. And I used to know this woman who, uh, she was a fire raider. And she, she wanted to go work in Coney Island. Columbine the Combustible. 
and uh, I had tattoos, but not like the tattoo man. I mean, Michael was a tattoo man at the time, and he had, a, oh my God, like a lot, a lot of tattoos. But they told me they needed a ticket seller. And I had had so much experience working in the line in the crowds that, and needing a job. Well, I said yes, and as someone who spent most of my free time writing poetry and prose, which is probably what I still think of doing and try to do all the time as much as I can. Well, it was an ideal job because at that time Coney Island was still the wild, wild, wild east. East of New York, you know, not wild east of Europe, you know, but it was just wild place. I mean, maybe it was not in its heyday of wildness, but it was still wild. I mean, the craziness and you know, the smell of cotton candy and grease and melting things. And I think what really got me was the smell of cotton candy and grease, you know, that frying grease they used to cook everything. And it just was uh, amazing. I had the first impression of Madrid like when I first worked in Coney Island. Like Madrid was a carnival, man. The city is unbelievable. Insanity. Like midgets, man. Midgets dancing in the middle of the middle class people dressed nicely, shopping and the shopping district, deformed people, prostitutes, pimps, you know, rent boys, like church ladies, churches, beggars, shop. I was like a carnival, man. It was like a carnival of eight million people. Like I felt I was like in the real carnival, like, like Coney Island where I work is getting gentrified, they're changing it. And when I was in, my, in New York, it used to be like a carnival because I remember when I first landed in New York, I went to St. Mark's Place. And back then, St. Mark's Place was like the souk, you know, like the souk in, um, in, in um, you know, the Arab villages where they have the souk, where they sell all the, all the weird stuff and all the shops. So I remember walking from um, off into St. Mark's Place to Tompkins Square, and that's when these people still used to live in Tompkins Square. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm home, man. Welcome to the new Jerusalem, you know. Here I am, like, waiting for Jesus Christ to, like, walk through the souk and, you know, walk through the temple of the East Village and, and start, you know, turning the tables of the moneylenders. And it's like, a, you know, um, St. Mark's Place. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's kind of like the feeling I got in Madrid. 